Hello, Connecticut, and welcome to the Paid Leave Podcast. The title uh, basically says it all. I'm Nancy Barrow, and I will be delving into this new state program and how it can help you and your family. This podcast will give you information you should know about Connecticut Paid Leave and maybe just a little bit more. Connecticut Paid Leave brings peace of mind to your home, family, and workplace. Welcome to the Paid Leave Podcast. Well, hello and welcome. Today, we're continuing our conversation about military families and Connecticut paid leave. And joining me today are Kimberly Brown and Casey Timberlake, both who've had husbands in the military who were injured while they were serving. So Kimberly Brown is the Elizabeth Dole Fellow for the state of Connecticut. And that's how I actually found you through the Fellows Program. And you have such an important story that we need to hear, Kimberly. And Casey Timberlake is 103rd Airlift Wing Airman and Family Readiness Program Manager on the airbase. Is that correct? That is correct. That mouthful is correct. Okay. And you care for your husband who is a Marine and suffers from PTSD. And first, thank you and your husband for your service. And can you just tell me, Casey, what you do for the family members of servicemen and women as the Family Readiness Program Manager? Absolutely. Uh, my job, um, in, a, in a nutshell, is to take the military mumbo jumbo and translate it in a way that the families can understand and digest what what's happening. Um, I've been working for the military for about 13 years now, and they don't slow down for civilians or explain to civilians what they're talking about. So I make sure that the families can comprehend what language they're speaking and also help connect them to the resources that are available to them. Are there a lot of resources that are available to the family members? Absolutely. There's, there's so many, it's almost overwhelming. So it's nice to have a point of contact at the air base who can corral those, those resources and point people in the right direction because it is sometimes a maze and people often get lost. So were you in the military or do you just work for the military? I don't think the military would want me. No, I do not. I've never been in the military. Um, I started this um, because of my husband. Um, He was a Marine stationed in North Carolina at Camp Lejeune. And you really only have a few choices down there for careers. And I was lucky enough to start my journey with all of this. Um, with the Marine Corps, and um, even luckier to get to continue it in Connecticut, where I'm from, um, with the Air Guard. So it's it's been a wild ride. And if you had told me 20 years ago that this is what I would be doing, I probably wouldn't have believed you. Yeah, <laughs> I bet. It's funny how life kind of plays out, isn't it? It's, yes, yes. <laughs> and how did you, uh, Casey, how did you and Kimberly meet? We... Uh, ran in the same circles for a couple of years, right, Kim, without meeting. And people would tell me, you need to meet Kim Brown. Like, you guys would be instant friends. Like, your stories are so similar. You two need to meet. I I really think I heard that for two years before I actually met Kim in person. And people were right. We were kindred spirits in this caregiver journey. Um, And we hit it off right away. And um, what's really interesting is not only have we been able to support each other as friends, but our professions kind of intersect as well. So we're able to to help each other on that front as well. Which is wonderful. Um, Kimberly, let's mm-hmm. start with you. When I met you and started talking with you, I was pretty amazed at what you had been through and what you're doing now at the Elizabeth Dole Foundation. They're pretty cool. Tell me a little bit about the Elizabeth Dole Foundation and how you got involved with it. Yeah, so the Elizabeth Dole Foundation is a program that is meant to put the spotlight on the folks that are tending to our ill or injured um, wounded warriors, you know, because there are so many resources out there that speak to the veteran um, themselves. But what we tend to forget is there are people that are supporting these individuals when they get home. And that honestly is when the work really kicks in when we're really, I guess you could say our deployment begins, you know, our work begins our hard, our hard work. Um, And so the foundation's 
really main focus is to not only support these individuals, but help them identify. Because for me personally, and I think this probably speaks to Casey's journey as well as, you know, I don't think either of us, even, even now I kind of cringe at the word caregiver. Um, I don't think either of us has have identified as, as that title, but um, hearing kind of those qualifications and taking a step back and realizing that, you know, compared to our peers who are, um, you know, married and have kids and haven't experienced that injury component of it, you know, it is an additional role to be a caregiver and just being able to identify and put, a name to those those kind of the criteria to become a, a caregiver and those additional pieces of our life that we're executing on a daily basis. I think validation, number one, is something that the foundation really strives to do with that identification piece. Two would be to really help our community partners and our um, the communities that we live in really understand that, you know, a homecoming isn't the end of a story for any soldier um it's really the beginning um, of another part of that journey. Uh, I don't think anybody can go to war and come back without feeling different Mm. at at a minimum, Mm -hmm. I would say, you know, take out the injury piece. I think everybody experiences really abnormal things and has really normal um, reactions to it, but then they need the support and that's where the families come in and the foundation really strives to educate those in the community that don't have that firsthand experience so that they can be good community partners and so that they can be a resource to the folks that are living in our communities with these additional roles or, you know, injuries. Um, And I think three, it's a legislation component where the foundation really works to help progress legislation and advocate for those families and use their position of power for good. So um, EDF is a really cool organization and they do a lot of great work. Um, they've worked on like the Mission Act. They've helped most recently. A lot of caregivers are getting kicked out of the VA caregiver program um, because now they've changed the eligibility. So folks are losing income. Um, families are feeling that invalidation that they were feeling at the beginning of their journeys where they didn't identify as caregivers. You know, clearly what I'm doing for my caregiver I mean, for my wounded warrior isn't good enough. So I'm being kicked out of the program. Mm. Um, so the, the foundation really helps to be that voice or that conduit um, between, you know, legislation and the actual people utilizing it. It's, it's interesting. Didn't you just tell me you were in Chicago talking to some people? Yep. Um, so I was in Chicago uh, over Memorial Day weekend. Uh, I spent one day handing out swag bags to military that were ruck marching in honor of those that they lost, whether it was to suicide or whether it was combat. And the following day, I sat down with um, some great community partners from like the college universities to their um their own state officials. And we had a nice conversation, like a round table about, you know, our, our stories and how the different community partners can really collaborate with us or, or support us. Well, I think that the Elizabeth Dole foundation is really lucky to have you (laughs) as a fellow here in Connecticut. You're really active and uh, you have a really important story to tell. Why don't you tell how you became a caregiver? Tell, tell your story. Yeah. Okay. Um, so my caregiver journey and uh, caregivers start off at different places in this journey. You know, some that point of entry is at the moment when their person gets injured. And to me, I feel like if that was my journey, I would have had an easier time identifying as a caregiver, but I met my now ex-husband, um, after he had deployed to Iraq twice already, I actually met him on, um, it's called r and uh, while he was taking a quick break from his third deployment to Iraq. And um, I didn't know it at the time, but when we moved in together and we got married, I realized that there were a lot of things that he needed additional support with. He had been blown off of a Humvee um, uh, on his second tour and suffered a traumatic brain injury. And of course, you know, coinciding with that, how can you not get PTSD from what you're witnessing? Um, Chris has lost over 33 people to suicide alone, um, some of which happened, as they call it, in theater over um, overseas. Uh, and then he's, you know, lost a lot of people to just being deployed, um, you know, war. And those those pieces alone really wreak havoc on him. And 
I realized that I needed to be that calming force for him. I realized that taking my kids to Disney on ice was no longer something that I could just pack up and we'd go and we'd have a good time. It was now my ex was going to be scanning the crowds, looking for all possible exits. He was going to feel overwhelmed by the amount of people. He wasn't going to enjoy the act with us the way, you know, my daughters and I would. Mm -hmm. And so I started to recognize that there, there was a need for me to kind of be that, um, be more than I was for him. So I would say my caregiver journey just, I was thrown into it. <laughs> yeah. And then did he do another, did he do four tours of duties? Yep. yep. So he was deployed to Iraq in 07, 09, 2011. And then his final deployment was to Afghanistan in 2013. And the name of that uh, base was Rocket City because they took so much incoming fire Um that the base was known for it. And basically, you know, they would either blow it out of the sky and catch it before it could do any destruction or it would land and it would hurt somebody. And um, how do you live in a environment like that on a daily basis and then not need support or resources? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. You didn't really identify as a caregiver. You said you were just being a good wife. Yep. I, cause, because I think, you know, it, the general population probably can echo the sentiment that when you, you think about a caregiver, you're pic picturing somebody wiping drool, you know, yeah. bathing people, kind of those really physical elements of caretaking. But you don't think about like the pieces where you're like being the eyes and ears for your wounded warrior because they can't handle crowds or you're um, looking for those telltale signs that we need to get out of here and we need to leave before this becomes something else or you know, being summertime, uh, fireworks are going to start going off randomly in our suburb um, neighborhoods here throughout the, the summer. And that in itself being a trigger for my spouse for multiple days on end, um, you know, and being able to kind of look out for those signs and then help him through it. So to me, it was hard to see myself as a caregiver because I wasn't doing those physical elements. I was really just looking out for my spouse in the way I know. Um, you know, it would be reciprocated to me. So did you still feel like like a single mom, even when he was home? Yes, 100 percent. I think, um, you know, this is something Casey and I chat about quite frequently is, you know, in addition to being a caregiver, we both are parents to two small children, you know, and on top of that, then you have your own adult responsibilities. Um, but, you know, while he's triggered, he's not able to be a parent. He's not able to be a spouse. He's not able to do those um, additional tasks that are required when you have small children. So a lot of the time I, I felt like I was wearing multiple hats and doing it pretty singularly on my own. Um, and you had to quit your job, right? When he came home, you did you quit your job to take care of him? Because you couldn't do both. Yeah, I had quit my job actually um, during his uh, deployment to Afghanistan and, and moved home because I didn't have any support or resources for myself in Georgia. My home is and has always been Connecticut. So being able to be close to family um, there, you know, the mental health component of deployments, you, I don't think anybody really realizes it until they're actually going through it, but the people that you leave behind, you know, we're here on edge waiting for you to come home. If you get to come home, I mean, Casey and I both, uh, know people who have had the experience where they say goodbye and that's it. Their person comes home in a box. So um, I just think that at the time I needed, I left Georgia to be home with my family. And then when he came home, I noticed a pretty significant difference in him. Um, I think I say this pretty often, but um, whatever happened in Afghanistan that he's not telling me, I think stole the last pieces of the person I loved. Um, so for me, working wasn't even an option at that point. I needed to be the eyes and the ears for my household and, you know, be that voice for Chris as well. Yeah. And I can imagine that's very stressful on a marriage and your marriage didn't survive that. Tell, tell me, that must have been a hard component, too, because I'm sure there was guilt there for you. A hundred percent. Um, I struggled a lot and <laughs> Casey is my unpaid therapist. Um, the <laughs> amount of days that I would text her and be like, dude, I don't think I can make it another day. I don't, I don't know. 
Um, you know, one of the big things with my situation in particular is my ex wasn't willing to take those steps for himself to get treatment. He wasn't willing to go to therapy. He wasn't willing to stay on his meds. It was a constant battle and me dragging him to those things. And at some point, you know, when your house is on fire, you got to decide to take your kids and yourself out of the burning building. You can't burn down with your house. Right. Um, so that's what I chose to do. But I did, I did fear that the community that I, I love so much and, um, you know, I do so much for, I feel like I felt like they wouldn't accept me anymore. Why would, why would you want someone in that community who has this like desire to support everybody, but you're abandoning your own wounded warriors, how I felt. Mm. Um, so yeah, a lot of guilt. And, you know, I, even today, when I think about all the things that have happened between him and I, and, um, I just, I, you know, it's hard for me because part of me knows that this is illness. This is the cost of war. Um, but I also recognize that I'm a human being too. And that caregiving doesn't give you that hall pass to just act and behave and traumatize your entire family. There's, there, there's a point where the plug has to be pulled. So Casey, tell me your story. <laughs> um, we, my husband and I met, um, before he joined the Marine Corps. So I've been with him, uh, since boot camp. I actually went to his boot camp graduation. So, um, I've seen the evolution of um, my husband prior to the Marine Corps and the person who he is today, um, after his service. And, um, it's, it's a night, night and day difference. Um, he deployed twice a year to Iraq and then nine months to Afghanistan. And, um, I don't know too much about either one of those deployments. Um, he doesn't talk, uh, too frequently about, he'll tell me the funny stories, um, you know, and the, the, the silly things that happened and, um, the crazier antics that, that happened, but not necessarily, um, any of the stories that explain why he is the way he is now. Um, he also, he was in artillery, so there is a TBI component with him as well. Um, I remember a phone call, um, while on his Iraq deployment where he said that his ears had been bleeding for a week. Um, and at that point in time, I knew nothing about nothing. And I was kind of like, Oh, that's gross. And, you know, now with the information I have and the benefit of hindsight, I'm like, wow, that's, that's pretty awful. Like that's, that's a traumatic brain injury right there. So he definitely has, um, repeated blast exposure and injuries from that to his brain. Um, so he is, um, sometimes forgetful, uh, sometimes moody. Um, and a lot of the ways that Kim talked about having to be the eyes and the ears, that same thing happens here. Um, I also joke that I'm the administrative assistant for our entire household because all that kind of bill paying, grocery shopping, day-to-day -day life stuff falls on me. Um, because of his memory issues, you know, it's just not, not a good idea to send that man to the grocery store. Um, yeah, he'll come home with a lot of stuff I, that you didn't ask for. Yeah. And none of the stuff we actually need. So right. yeah, we've, we've learned that. And I think, um, he, he got out, um, while we were still living in North Carolina. And I think that that was tough for him too, to be, um, out of the service, but still living in a highly populated area of Marines, you know, everywhere you go, there's, you know, a, mil a million Marines and that's always the topic, you know, where did you go? What unit were you with? Who did you serve with? You know, and Marines know when you talk about bases or the years that you were overseas, they, they have an idea of what happened to you. So almost in the community, he couldn't escape it. You know, we couldn't go out to dinner without bumping into somebody that led to a discussion about his service. And, you know, I, I feel like just, just living in that area, um, kind of kept traumatizing him. You know, our house would shake from, the artillery training that was happening on Camp Lejeune, oh, wow. um, you know, air 
planes would follow, <laughs> fly over our house. Helicopters would fly over our house. So when we decided to move, I thought that that was a good thing for him to kind of get away from that environment where he could just be him, you know, instead of, you know, Rich, the, the veteran. Um, but Rich's, Rich's descent was very slow. Um, and I didn't notice it happening because things seemed reasonable. Like we had just, this was when we were still living in North Carolina, we had just bought the house and he said, you know, we, we just bought this house and, you know, let's, let's kind of scale back on going out because we really don't have all that, you know, that much money since we just bought this house. So maybe we shouldn't go out as much. And that made sense to me. Yeah, you're, you're right. And then he would say, well, I feel bad, you know, playing video games in the living room. So could I take this spare bedroom and kind of make that my man cave and play video games in there? Yeah, sure. If you don't feel comfortable in the living room, you know, go, go ahead over there. Um, and then it turned into him just never coming out of that room. Wow. Um, and it, and, you know, in the moment, it it all made sense. And I had a pretty stressful job with the Marine Corps at that point in time. Um, and I was at work a lot and working with families and um, Marines who were experiencing, you know, deployments and trauma and things like that in front of me where my husband was slowly sliding into a dark place. And I didn't see that it was happening. Um, so in 2013, he said, I can't, I can't do this anymore. And he, um, checked himself into an inpatient facility and spent about six months there. And all of this was just very shocking. Um, it seemed really abrupt to me, but when I look back on it now, all the signs were there mm -hmm. and I just, I just missed it. Um, so we spent a few more years in North Carolina when he got out of the inpatient and we moved up here in 2016 and, um, the care is wonderful here. He has a good experience with the VA, so that's helpful. So, um, he does, you know, make his appointments and take his medication and, and do the things that, that he needs to do. Um, but it doesn't lessen any sort of caregiver responsibility. Caregiving is the key component, and so far, 13 people have applied for benefits under Connecticut paid leave for the military um, aspect of what we have. So Connecticut paid leave has two types of leave when it comes to military families, which may have helped you if, if it was available back then. And I know that hindsight's twenty twenty, and this is all pure speculation, but there's income replacement available to military family members not the person in the military. So it would have helped you, Casey, and it would have helped Kimberly for sure. Mm -hmm. The two types are military caregiver leave and qualifying exigency leave. So uh, you can get up to 12 weeks of income replacement if the qualifying military family members can do that. So military caregiver leave is taken by a parent, a spouse, or a child, or next of kin. So they've really made it a very broad term because mm -hmm. next of kin can be sister, brother, aunt, mm -hmm. cousins, and even the service member can say, hey, I, I want my godmother or a life partner or a really good friend to be able to care for me. That would give you 12 weeks of income replacement to take care of someone who is injured in a tour or the line of duty when they're serving our country. I imagine that would have helped you both tremendously. Absolutely. I think I'm I'm incredibly lucky because I've worked for the military through this entire time. So they do have an understanding when um, I want to attend in a week a week long program with my husband, or if I want to accompany him to appointments. So I've been incredibly lucky. Right. But I have you know friends and colleagues who have not been so lucky and have not had that option. You know, to take the amount of leave that I've had to take and right. um, just to be supportive and present. Yeah. And the, the other type that we have is exigency leave, which is a little more complicated, but still I think it would be great because both of your husbands were deployed and that's really what exigency leave is, right? So um, 
the exigency provision allows for these conditions, short notice deployment of seven days or less, military events and related activities to maybe um, alternative child care if the existing arrangement has to be changed. Parental leave uh, care is under that as well. So if the military person's parents, maybe they have Alzheimer's or they're in a care facility, you can attend meetings or get hospice involved or whatever is needed. And financial and legal arrangements, I'm sure that's really important too. Powers of attorney, um, transferring bank accounts when they go, um, updating a living will. And counseling. So if your kids are having a really hard time with the father, your, your father being deployed or whether the mother's deployed, they can get some, some counseling, which is really important. And R&R, you mentioned that, Kimberly. You can um, take R&R with the soldier and they'll give you paid leave for that. Post-deployment activities like arrival ceremonies, reintegrations, or briefings for 90 days following termination of their active duty status. So that's what the exigency leave portion is and what it allows and gives you up to 12 weeks of paid leave for these things, which I think is really wonderful that Connecticut has this. Mm -hmm. I agree. Do you think that other military members know about this program? No, absolutely not. No. Okay, well, great. So I'm going to utilize both of you so we can get the word out there because I feel that, you know, your stories are so incredibly compelling. And I feel like there's a lot of people out there that are like you that don't know that this exists. And if they're eligible and they can utilize this, you know, I I hope that we can get the word out to other caregivers. So it wouldn't be so stressful. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, even just a few days off to to reset is so huge in what Kim and I do. You know, just being able to sit in silence for a hot second to regroup is definitely what we need sometimes. Yeah, and I think it's the most challenging part of our job, too, is like taking that respite or allowing ourselves to or feeling like we're deserving enough to be taking advantage of these programs. I know that you said to me uh, before, Kimberly, that after your marriage ended, you felt like you had given everything and there was nothing left to you. Yeah, I really did. I I mean, down to simple things like picking out an outfit at Marshall's and going shopping, like those things that are really relaxing or, you know, could be seen as an indulgence. I couldn't even experience because I had no idea. <laughs> I had no idea what my style was anymore. I had no idea what I liked, who I was, you know, I, I'm a very visual person. So for me, I felt like I was a skeleton at the end of everything. I really had to rebuild my life completely because I had focused so, so much and so solely on, you know, making sure that number one, my husband stayed alive. Um, and number two, that we were doing everything in our power to make sure that he was working towards getting services or was doing as well as he could. I mean, just the list of things that I managed for him, you know, even now he got fired from a job in April and uh, he's had my MacBook since then. And he's been checking with me. I'm the first person to know he got fired. I'm the first person to know he has an interview on the, you know, so it's just, tireless it's it's never ending and at times it can really feel like there's there's no way out of you know taking care of this person her road was far bumpier than mine um and that's just by virtue of me working for the military um so what i like to give back to people is kind of the pay it forward mentality i make sure i give them all the information that i have so that their road is a little bit more clear. Um, because to get out of the military is a life-changing experience in and of itself. Yeah. But then to get out of the military with an injury um, and having to figure out how to advocate for yourself, what services are available, how to help your family, how to make sure your kids are okay, it's, it's almost too much. Um, so when the airmen come to see me who are transitioning out, 
I make sure that they're linked with the VA and the resources that I've used personally um, to kind of help make their journey a little bit more seamless. And now there's Connecticut Paid Leave that you can also tell them about. And I'll give you any, we have infographics and I can give you whatever you need, but I, I think that resource in itself just for Connecticut yeah. is is really valuable for someone who's going through exactly what the two of you went through. And if they're in the beginning of the process, it really could be a game changer for somebody. And even that deployment leave piece, I mean, our Army and Air National Guard deploy frequently. Yeah. So to, to have that well at their fingertips is, is a game changer. I'm thrilled that we can do anything for people who have served in the military. So, And what you do, you also serve. I mean, as as wives of military members who come back injured from serving their country, it's a big burden for you. And I think it's been very clear from the stories that you've told that more help needs to come your way. And I'm thankful that at least in Connecticut, we have this. We need a national program for <laughs> paid leave. Hopefully that will happen sometime. <laughs> at least we are, we are blessed that we have this in Connecticut. Yeah, and you're, you. you're doing a great job connecting to folks who can help amplify that message as well. I think you know, what Casey was saying about being, being um, kind of, you know, interlaced into this community already as a resource of your, um, you kind of, the path is e- easier for you. Um, I would echo that. Like once I got looped into like all of the resources, um, it was easier for me to find things or if I didn't know, I yeah. had a, well, you know, folks in the industry who could point me in the right direction. So using me and Casey and folks like us who can kind of amplify the message can only, you know, hopefully reach more people. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. Kimberly Brown is the Elizabeth Dole Fellow for the state of Connecticut. And really, honestly, no wonder they chose you, Kimberly. You're so amazing. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, you're just a wealth of information. And, And thank you so much for offering to help get the word out with Connecticut paid leave. I, I appreciate that. Of course, it takes a village. It does. And Casey, thank you so much for your service and sharing your story. And you both are very remarkable women. And I'm really Thanks. thankful that we did this podcast. Same. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And if you would like more information about military caregiver leave or qualifying exigency leave, please go to our website where you can also apply for benefits at ConnecticutPaidLeave.org. This has been another edition of the Paid Leave Podcast. Please like and subscribe so you'll be notified about new podcasts that become available. Connecticut Paid Leave is a public act with a personal purpose. I'm Nancy Barrow, and thanks for listening.